Join us, Alex and Colleen, self-proclaimed fake-it-till-you-make-it experts as we navigate the highs and lows of being a woman and how the pressure and overwhelm of trying to do it all often leads to feeling like an imposter in our own lives. On today's episode, we have a very special guest, my sister, Erica Thompson. Erica talks to us about her life's work as an educator in the Canadian North and the unique challenges and rewards that it brings. A little PSA before we get started, we did try out a new AV setup for this episode and it didn't quite work out. So you may notice a little bit more humming than usual and ask that you please give us grace because we still don't know what the fuck we're doing. Enjoy the show. Hi, Alex. Hi, Colleen. Um, I, had to, I had a question to ask you. So before we introduce Erica, I have a question to ask. Are you stressing out like so many people are about Taylor Swift tickets? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to actually ask me something profound. No. <laughs> Fuck no. no. I mean, I, don't get me wrong. I am a closeted Swifty. Like, I enjoy Taylor Swift. I think she is a highly gifted songwriter. And I find it unbelievable how many amazing, catchy songs she can write. I have the utmost respect for her. But there is no fucking way in hell that I would ever battle, A, the mental stress of trying to even think about getting those tickets, and B, want to be in that space. It, I think it's a busy, busy space. My, my oldest daughter is a huge Taylor Swift fan. Um, she has gone, she has tickets in Germany to go again, probably in a few places in Europe. And she did, she worked very hard to get her tickets. And, and I'm, I'm always impressed by this girl's marketing. Forget her songwriting. Like I find she's the most amazing marketer and I, I follow her for that. Like I, I'm amazed by that woman. She is impressive. She is definitely impressive. I think, you know, I have a lot of respect for her and actually for some reason, it's odd. She reminds me, like, my dad was actually a pretty big Taylor Swift fan, which I always found really interesting. Um, and I like that little tidbit, too, because when I think about her sometimes, he used to try to sing some of her songs every once in a while. Isn't that, Did you know that? Isn't that mm, precious? I no, like that. But I can see it. Yeah. So. If, if there was a concert of somebody living or past that you would is there somebody that you would really i know who's gonna be I like know i gonna already say. did it yes i'm going in november yes i mean anybody that knows me knows that i am a ridiculous fanatic bruce springsteen fan like it's basically part of my dna yeah for me i i've always been a huge sting fan was always a big police fan big zeppelin fan but i wanted so badly to see prince mm. and i am so disappointed i never got to see him he would have been right up there with me with I would have been trading bracelets and screaming and watching all the co costume changes and like that's a swifty moment to me watching <laughs> Prince he also could work anyway. I mean I am not a Prince fan but I can definitely appreciate that that would be a bucket list item yeah it was bucket list so today we it's a special day a special special it's a special event. day because it's the only the second guest that I know yes <laughs> and also related to me. Yeah. Alex just brings on family members. What did, what did we call it? The uh, Nepo, Nepo baby Nepo, episode. Nepo baby episode. I think the moral of the story is Alex doesn't actually have any friends. Oh, stop She just it. brings her family members who will, will, will humor her. You have a friend on every single week. That's true. It's you. It's me. <laughs> I was so corny. Uh, um, Alex has her sister Erica on this evening. And it is, we are recording this in the summer because my sister, as we'll get into, lives very far away in the Northwest Territory. So she comes home for the summer uh, for about a month every summer. And we really wanted to take advantage of while she's here so we can chat a little bit about her very interesting life and career path. And um, you may not be able to see it if you're watching this on YouTube in black and white, but she's also very, very tanned. She did want and to that, that out. And <laughs> that is not something that is current usually a state for her because she lives in the north so just wanted to give that the appreciation and um notice that it deserves so welcome erica older or younger sister i'm younger you're the younger yeah. sister um alex i do have to ask though what's it like having your sister sitting next to you because one of the things that we have so loved throughout season one was pretty much after every single episode erica would send you a text and tell you what she thought of the show 
And we've, we've so loved all of the encouragement. And Erica, you've been a huge part of that. So what does it feel like to have Erica on? Um, I mean, I think it's awesome. I always love to do anything that I can with Erica. And because we get to spend so little time together, it's very special. Um, I'm, I'll be curious to see if we get a text from her after this one airs. I feel like, that sucked. <laughs> Uh, no, it's pretty cool, and I'm really excited for people to hear um, all the amazing, awesome things about Erica. Yeah. So, Erica, happy summer. Mm, How's thanks. your vacation? Uh, it's been great. You know, as much as it may seem ridiculous to point out your tan, I, I have crafted it over many hours. Mm -hmm. is, I do not my think favorite so. summertime activity is yeah. sun and sand and sea. So, it's been good, even though there was a little slow start okay. to the... The weather, I recognize that it was needed, but uh, it's been great since then. Yeah, I mean, no judgment here on tan. No. Tan promotion. Mm -hmm. No. I was no. just going to say, as excited as you may be, I am so excited as a, a huge fan of your show, so I'm, I'm really honored to be able to be with you. Yeah, we're um, so glad, glad you're here. Yeah, yeah, I listened from day one. I, like I said earlier, it's my first podcast ever that I ever listened to. So, Isn't that great? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you were a po podcast virgin before right? us. Yeah, I'm really yeah. glad I saved it. <laughs> yeah, for us. Well, yeah. I feel like mm -hmm. if you were going to um, disrupt your podcast virginity, this would be the one to mm -hmm. do it. Yes, because we're awkward, not quite sure what we're doing, just like losing your virginity in real life. Wow. We, we if that makes it, I will be sure. <laughs> <laughs> who, who knows? <laughs> I guess I know because I cause you know I, you edit it yeah <laughs> may make it in may not I never know what's going to be in the show <laughs> yeah. um Erica I have to know so we're going to go through a little bit about your career because it's fascinating how does a girl from Yarmouth end up in the Northwest Territories such a good question tell us your journey how did you get there what made you like tell us your story uh, to be honest, I've been asked this question quite a few times. And if I really think back to the time when I ventured into the North at first, like, I don't know that I had a great reason. Like, I think at the time I graduated from school, I knew I wanted to be a teacher. So, like, that, that path was clear. And I knew I wanted to go far. But I didn't, at the time, say, I want to go, you know, North, and I want to teach in Indigenous communities, and I want to, you know try to learn how to make a difference or try to learn how to partner and be in a relationship. Like I wasn't as evolved at 23 Ooh. for sure. So I sort of was between New Zealand um, and Canada's North. So I ended up going Canadian North. Um, I think at the time I had a boyfriend who wasn't ready for New Zealand, but Canadian North seemed reasonable. So that's what we did. He <coughs> wasn't ready for Montreal. <laughs> <laughs> Alex knows some inside story there. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's a little bit weird actually. Having you. No. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Angles. <laughs> yeah, so I think at the time, you know, I I definitely knew I wanted to do something interesting with my teaching career. Yeah. So you've been a teacher for how long now? So I taught in a classroom from 23 to five years ago. Okay. So I guess that was like 13 years in the classroom. And I've been out of the classrooms going on my 18th or my fifth year. So tell everybody about what you're doing now. So I first began my teaching career in Manitoba. I was really green. Like um, I moved to this like remote fly-in community. Uh, it was the community of Garden Hill, which is kind of an OG Cree uh, nation. I taught grade seven, which was quite a learning experience in all the ways, <laughs> really eye-opening, yeah. you know. Um, I didn't do a lot of research beforehand, so I think I really learned by doing. I think I was really ready to like, you know, get involved and like be part of a community. And I think if I go back now, I can see that being part of a community, being in service, like those are core values. And definitely that's something that I found like a comfortable home in the North. Um, so I started in Manitoba. I worked my way sort of North consistently. I eventually went to the Eastern Arctic in Arctic Bay, Nunavut, which is the third northern community in Canada. And then I settled in the Beaufort Delta region of the Northwest Territories, where I've been for like my 11th year. And are you in a consulting role now? Yeah, so about five years ago, 
I'm, I moved from the classroom into a, a education consultant for our district. So our district is like nine schools in eight communities. It's the like most, our largest geographical geographic region um, in the Northwest Territories and sort of the farthest spread out community schools. And you're working with indigenous youth. Yeah. yeah. So our school system is, I think it's like 92 or 95% indigenous. Um, so indigenous students. And it's sort of a hybrid. There's like one kind of urban center and then all the other communities are rural, like small communities. So you must run, do you run into a different set of issues? Are they the same issues? Like there are definitely unique challenges to being in a remote area, to being mm. in, uh, you know, indigenous communities where uh, services and supports aren't always readily available. Um, I think right now, not that that's so much unique, because I think youth uh, mental health supports and you know support services for youth is really challenging, kind of globally. Mm. Um, certainly, that is a is a is a challenge that the the geography of where I teach um, and the communities are really finding, right? That just really aren't enough supports. And I think, to be honest, that's one of the things that makes the teaching jobs and consulting jobs unique Ooh. because you're really balancing the what you're you know kind of trained to do and what's needed sure right and sure. being responsive isn't always in line with what you're kind of like trained to do so where does imposter syndrome show up with your career it has shown up in a lot of a lot of places and in different places so certainly when i was in the classroom i mean when i was young in the classroom like you really know you don't know so, so you are really thinking any minute they're going to find out that I don't know. You know, I, I remember really early in my first teaching job, like basically being like at the door with like a class full of grade seven boys, like wanting to leave, thinking that I was my job to stop them from doing so. Thinking at any moment, if anybody comes by this, <laughs> comes by this classroom and looks in this window, they're going to be like, what is happening? Yeah. You know, and then thinking like, okay, I better like get my shit together. <laughs> you know, because, I'm grown up and like, how am I yeah. going to learn that? You know, like, how am I going to learn how to how to navigate the space, like, equitably, respectfully, authentically, that's not too authoritarian or, you know, yeah. like, so that was, that was always, that's always there. I don't think there was a day in my teaching career where that wasn't there, you know. Um, and then I had, I think I had some successes. So I, I had a really... I was really fortunate. I had really good mentors. I was really received well in those communities. I had a lot of opportunities to do programming with indigenous community members and resource people and do some really amazing kind of land-based authentic learning with, with students. And so because of those really amazing opportunities and experiences and the success that we had, I ended up with some of the credit from that, which was humbling and unique and amazing, but then also really sets up, you know, quite a bit of pressure. Like, <laughs> Well, it would. <laughs> right? Yeah, and, and I find that we've, we've talked about winning awards before and, and mm -hmm. getting credit before that suddenly, and I even feel about, you know, our podcast, we're into season two and I feel, okay, we said we're going to be better than season one. Now we have to be better than season one. You won an award, you got credit for what you were doing. Mm -hmm. Now you have to, I feel like we should interject to say what the award was because it is a spectacular award please do you need to be able to brag lady yeah and i mean i would say that is something that really has never like i've never gotten there i don't know how when it was in 2017 or something like yeah it was a national award from the prime minister oh. right for teaching which only a very small percentage of the population wins or is gonna win i just got goosebumps right? you got a <laughs> national award for teaching mm -hmm. from the prime minister Old yeah. JT. Yoo-hoo! Right? She is a big deal. <laughs> she is a big deal. That's amazing! Yeah. Is so, it framed? Um, yep, it is framed. Where I, I wouldn't necessarily have done that, but my husband, who, you know, is my number one supporter and fan, insisted. So it's like in my hallway in my house. Oh, everybody <laughs> should see it as they walk in yeah. and as they leave. <laughs> This is this is what you're walking into. This is the greatness. You know, I love that. I wouldn't put it in my office. Like he really felt like I should, but I feel like that's just a lot. Like so, my master's degree and my award are in my house. Um, but you know, and I know them and I see them. And but it's weird. Like I'm grateful 
Yes. I think it's really amazing that somebody wanted to acknowledge that activity. I think, like, in my life and in that work, like, one person getting the credit for that experience is weird. I mean, okay. Because it was a collective effort that landed landed us there, you know? Um, so so that really, in I think, is an invitation into ways, like, how to think of that experience and honor it but then also check in with how I feel about it, right? Okay, we're going to take a pause on this for a moment because what is it with women (laughs) that we don't celebrate the big things? We don't celebrate our awards. We don't celebrate our achievements. We're not out there telling everybody, this is what I did. Look at me. Why don't we do that? Yeah, right? Because it feels weird. I think it's an (laughs) invitation for people to then hold you to a higher standard and that is scary for a lot of people because um, I think we often get caught up in our own heads about well whether or not it was warranted or what that means now or what level do I need to show up at now that I have been acknowledged in this way and I like I I don't think that's founded particularly not in this case but I understand it and I think a lot of us are just nervous about getting to those next levels particularly in our careers or any kind of milestone because then there is a, a new set of expectations whether it's from the outside or the inside and that really doesn't matter um, to then have to live up to and to then okay so now what now I've reached this level now what 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 are people expecting from me now yeah I am sure a lot of people have patted you on the back over the last couple of years for this but Come on, Alex. <laughs> Let's pat her on the back. In fact, pat yourself on the back. Two hands. I couldn't pat on she the back. She was far away. <clears throat> I was spiritually petting on the back. Spiritually petting. <laughs> you know, teachers are amazing. They really are changing the world. Um, it's you know, our kids. Our kids so desperately need good teachers. Um, so that's impressive. That to me is like almost getting the Oprah Teacher of the Year award almost, but, you know. Yeah, I mean, I contextualize it in a lot of ways, and it evolves, right? Like, I mean, I it rarely comes up. Like, I don't really have occasion to be like, and by the way, I don't know if you know this about me, but, you know. So people <laughs> don't introduce you at events as, this is Erica. You know, I had, I've yeah. only really <clears throat> done events, like, twice, and it did come up then, yes. Um, but in my day-to-day, like, but occasionally I do know that I'm part of a network of people who did, and I do think of it as a chance to be mentory in that way. So like every year I review for them, right? Which is a lot, which is a lot of work, and it comes at a really weird time, but I mean like, I know what that felt like for me, and I know what that kind of like did for me, and so the ability to be a part of that for others, like, I hold that pretty important, like I hold that dear and important, you know? And I think of it that way, like, like this is an opportunity and like a platform, if you will, to be able to really share share a talent or a gift, right? Like, and I hope that I am doing that, you know, every day, every every opportunity I get in in the space I'm in. One of the ways to combat imposter syndrome is to actually listen to how awesome the people in your life think you are. If you're looking for the perfect gift for a loved one, where you can tell them all of the things that make them special, visit my Drawbridge Creative Etsy shop and purchase a Things We Love About You custom poster. With several styles to choose from, it's a fabulous gift for any milestone birthday, anniversary, retirement, or just because. Okay. We're back uh, here with my sister, Erica, talking a little bit about her career path and the various ways in which imposter syndrome has shown up for her. So we chatted a little bit about discomfort with awards and sort of the different pressures and overwhelm that that might present. How else do you feel that imposter syndrome has presented for you throughout your career? So I have like this really amazing opportunity to be invested wholly in a subject that I'm super passionate about. I did my master's in um, Indigenous studies and land-based Indigenous education. Um, in I completed it in 2015. And so my kind of job with the school board is to look at indigenizing education and looking at making um, 
our programming and curriculum as relevant and authentic as possible to the indigenous populations uh, that our, our communities have. So we have like two kind of distinct indigenous populations, the Gwich'in and the New Bialowit, and then they're also Métis in the, the school board region. And so programming that's authentic, land-based, and, and really centered in the community is kind of the focus. So it's kind of a unique position to be in, right? Um, as a, as a non-Indigenous person, as a white settler Canadian, living in that space um, and really being cognizant of what education I bring to that space, what opportunities I'm bringing into that space, and then also how to really be a partner and uh, in, in an actual productive, authentic relationship in that space. So I don't do that job myself as a non-Indigenous person, I share that job um, with a, a woman from Aklavik, her name is Alma, who is amazing. You know, she's this, uh, she's local, she's, she wouldn't consider herself an elder, um, but maybe in training, um, and really just so wise, so compassionate, so caring, and so um, helpful and inviting to learn, unlearn, um, kind of co-create learning together. And so that partnership and that allyship um, is something that we are really cultivating that we've been working on for like four years. Um, and so that is awesome for me, but then also it's, it's a learning curve, you know, <laughs> and not always a comfortable one. Um, and I really think though I have that amazing opportunity and that experience, I also spend so much of my time thinking, and should I be there, right? Like, should I be there? Yeah. It's interesting because so many women um, often wonder, I mean, with imposter syndrome, um, do I deserve a spot at this table? Um, that's, that's big. Yeah, and it's complex. And it does not show up in the same way all the time, right? Like some days I feel, in, I don't entitled is not the right word, but like I like I should be there. Like I have something to offer. Like that I have done the work. Like that, you know, that that my passion, experience, and openness to learn are really important. And other times I think, and if I wasn't there, what would it look like? Good or bad, right? Um, so what, how do you combat those feelings when they come in and you're feeling like, you know, when that question comes in, like, should I be here? How do you sort through that to make sure that you're showing up in the best way and that you are truly contributing? A huge piece of that for me is, in, is intentions. So I really spend a lot of time checking in with my intentions. Like, are my intentions, how am I showing up today, right? Am I ready to learn? Am I ready to listen? Am I ready to check my own privilege, experience, kind of involuntary tendencies that really come from being raised in a meritocracy, like being raised individually, not, you know, and not in a collective mindset, being raised in a community or society that isn't set up in the same way that I'm living and working now, right? and really checking in with, am I dominating this space? Is my voice the voice that's being heard? You know, is this a place where what I have to say is really important and essential, or is this a place where somebody else is gonna say it if I don't say it, right? So I'm really clear about that. Oh, listen, I think these intentions are fantastic. I think we should all look at how we show up every day. Um, that's incredibly important, that puts and I love when you said, is my voice louder than anybody else's? Like, you can't be that person. You can't, you can't railroad in on a situation. If you're, if you're there, you should be there to learn as well. You well, know? I think, too, that's a really great litmus test to say, if I don't say this, will someone else say it? Well, mm -hmm. Because it's a really good way to kind of determine whether or not it's important that you say it. If you feel like people are going to get there anyway, and, you know then maybe it is kind of a time to step back, but if you're quite confident that you have a unique perspective, then, 
you know, people could really benefit from that insight. So I think that's really a really a great way to kind of frame things. And I think it also helps me sort of say, it, it helps kind of whittle down the do I deserve to be here, like, you know, outside eight, like outside doubt, and just about what's my purpose of being here, right? Like, I may have, I may know I have the information, right? Like, because I've gone to school or did the work or did the research or whatever it may be. Um, but if I say it, that may end the conversation, right? So it's important. So not like I, I do that a lot in my mind. I'm like, okay, yeah, I know that. And then what else is in this space to learn, right? And if it doesn't come up, I'll, you know, share it if I think it's worthwhile. Um, but I'm really here to engage and I'm really here to lift up the, the voices of others. And therefore, when they come out, then we can collaborate, then it's more equitable, then it's, you know, we're all gonna vibe in this space together. Are you able to balance it, or do you ever sit back afterwards? Are you lay, ever laying in bed thinking, gosh, I should have opened my mouth, I should have said things, I should have shared? I'm always laying in bed thinking about what I did or didn't do, or all yeah. the time. <laughs> who isn't? <laughs> who is <laughs> <laughs> like, Who is not doing that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you're not, we want to talk to you. <laughs> But I think it's been your life's work to figure out how to balance this passion that you feel, which I think even started by happenstance once you arrived. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not sure, I and mean, you can correct me on this, um, we're five years in the difference, and when you were starting your career, I was like partying and you know, doing something, I don't know. Anyway. Yeah, I know what she was doing. I digress. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> like, when you went, I'm not sure that you thought this is going to be my life's work. Mm -hmm. But once you arrived, you realized how passionate you felt about the communities and about working in those populations, which is pretty unique because a lot of people that go into those communities and face challenges don't stay. No, very few. So Ooh. I think even, you know, understanding once you arrived, what it meant to you. And then I think we should talk a little bit too about your master's program because you did some pretty impressive um trips and like uh just amazing land on the land events i'm kind of massacre this because i don't know the terminology but i just know that you were like living on the land for many 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 days like intense uh and like doing amazing feats that i always am sort of like how are we related because i can barely even you know glamp in a cottage and you're basically like completely living off grid and teaching and learning at the same time. So I think we should just, you know, talk a little bit about some of those experiences so people get an idea of just how integrated you are. Do tell, where have you been? <clears throat> um, you know, I've been, so like being outdoors is a passion of mine. Like I'm an, I'm an outdoors human. I, I really, nature is always like being a um, place of solace, I think, um, in chaos or stormy waters, you know? Like I'm from a young age, like I had a, a nature spot and went to that spot, you know, when things were tough or when we need to think about things. And so like, I've always had that kind of relationship with nature. Um, so the ability to like go and do like land-based teaching and learning with students and be like integrated and doing like bio on the land and studying samples and medicinal plants and, you know, like taking a botany book and going out and finding those species and then like working with community to make those medicines and like really, and then go gift them out. Like is that kind of fully integrated teaching is that's my jam. Like that's, I love that, you know, and I see, you see the results. So you know that it's important, right? Like I've been so fortunate to be a part of experiences that lift kids knowledge and lift kids confidence and, you know, lift the community as well in the learning and teaching and, and really like stay with kids and see kids be activated and that you can't deny it, you can't deny that effect. So like when a passion meets a need, it's a magical thing, really. Um, so yeah, I mean, I've done canoe trips, I've led them, like, you know, in my masters, like we hiked down to sacred valleys and, you know, like harvested taro and, and you know, learned in different land bases and from each other and, you know, largely like a probably 80% you know, indigenous students to 20% non-indigenous students. Like there were, there were great and impactful learning curves in that program for sure. And definitely like, 
I don't know what the appropriate word, like revolutionized, like changed forever, impacted my worldview. Um, like, you know, from in an instant almost. So you, you must see students light up Absolutely. right in front of you. That I see students that all the boxes are checked to send, you know, to be down a trajectory of, of non-success and see amazing things come up. You know, I've had so many success stories, you know, from students that have taught, not because not of me, but just in their school experience from that wraparound approach. Yeah. So many kids, it's not just about being in the classroom. The classroom does not work for all students, far from it. Um, so taking them out of the classroom and out into the land and, yeah. and being able to touch, you know, feel, yeah. show, smell, like. Well, and there's so much like school of thought to think about, um, you know, that like sense memory and genetic memory and like blood memory of the land and like that the land is healing in the, like in its relationship capacity that like, you know, like indigenous students, indigenous communities, people of the land. So reconnecting the land is healing and that healing activates neural pathways and neural pathways activate learning. and you know, it's like self-regulation, like, like land-based traditional self-regulation, like all the things that you kind of hear as buzzword terms here in Southern contexts of education, you know, there's like an indigenous, indigenized uh, land-based experience happening in indigenous communities, right? And so it's about really figuring out learning about the history, the context and the people of the land and then connecting, right? So yeah, I, I have, had so many of those experiences when I was in the classroom. Um, and now my kind of job is to help teachers do some of that work. Oh, so you're helping teachers facilitate yeah. other, oh, I love that. So it's like, now it's like about being with, right? Like learning with and sort of like doing that like education piece meets practical piece meets like best for all work, right? Here's something. You are something else. You're needed. You're, you know. I mean, need, so I am. Need more Erica's. You know. Yeah. Like I think art. Like my job. My I'm always thinking about like needed until like hopefully not needed, right? Like so like needed because committed. I'm one thousand percent committed to like working with and reconciliation and like really, but that also means that eventually not being needed. Oh is yes, my, is my job, right? Like so, my goal is to not be having this conversation about my role but more so being like how can we just be facilitating yes that and not be doing right how can we just be yeah so like that whole like kind of communities working together and community healing and that's that's what i'm in now i feel like um canada is in such a healing phase at the moment mm -hmm. and and really at just the beginning of it mm -hmm. um what what are your thoughts on that yeah, I mean, it's so, so it's really interesting like when you kind of like live immersed in a place and then you sort of like come back south and you're like, oh, okay, like some work to be done, right? Yes. <laughs> like, um, just in terms of like, like the education system, right? And there's this sort of like erroneous belief that like, you know, indigenous ed and indigenizing ed is for indigenous students. Like it has, it is, it so couldn't be farther from the truth. Like that idea of being in relationship with the land and the history and the communities and the people and the stories of, of where we are and that reverence as citizens of the world, you know, who really, I think, are in an era of unlearning, relearning, and then connecting, reconnecting, um, is hugely important, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that there's great possibility, um, but it's really a commitment on our parts as non Indigenous, as non -indigenous settler I, Canadians, I, you know, to recognize, to really recognize what it would have been like yeah. if we weren't here, yeah, right? And honestly, to think and hone in on our sheer fortune to be here in yeah. the ways that we are. Our absolute right? privilege. Yeah. And I, I think of it a lot. I, I, um, I sit back quite often and think about um, my own life and how I grew up and how absolutely 100% privileged I was. And um, and then I, and and how I can help, how what I can do, how I can mm -hmm. help change what my part, what my role is in this. Mm -hmm. I think about it a lot. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, really, for me, it's just been a, such a gift in my life to 
be a part of something different than where I grew up or, you know, and to be really like welcomed into the community because the, the feeling of community in an indigenous um, community, I'm sorry, that's a lot of communities, but yeah. <laughs> that's how we we'll, speak about we'll it, take right? Some communities out. Yeah. No, the community, but like but to it's... be a part of a, a community in good times and bad times and to be a support um, when you're needed and then to celebrate yeah. when the possibility, you know, when the, when the time is right. Um, it's been huge. Right? What is your favorite part of Indigenous life? Can I call it Indigenous life or the community? What's your favorite part of the community? It's my favorite part of yeah. what I'm doing and where I am. Yeah. Um, I think the celebrations are my favorite. You know, I think that when you're part of a feast or a gathering and you're watching pride, like you're watching Indigenous people connect to, um, you know, gifts, talents, and strengths of theirs, or like hobbies, or um, cultural traditions like dancing, or beating, or art, uh, artistic expressions, or sports, or anything that really is, brings people together. Um, you know, like the people in the region where I live, like laughing is such medicine, like, you know, so like when they get together, it's always big belly laughs, and it's always like big celebrations over food, and you know, it's a really a sharing time, like everybody brings something, and you know, you're just together, like there is no, this is mine, and I'm just going to do this, it's like we're doing this, and we're going to help each other do it, and I we're going to really tune in. I like it, I like it too. Awesome. I'm loving hearing these stories. I could listen to these stories over and over. I think it's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, that's why, like, sure, like, I'm very far away. I'm very far away from all of my support systems. Like, my no family anywhere here, you know? It's very cold. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, it's dark for a percentage of the time, you know? Like, winter goes on literally for 10 months. Yeah. Like, <clears throat> And those things are hard, like those are challenges, but I don't ever think of my life as hard. And I wouldn't trade it for one second. Like I am literally living and working in my passions every moment of my time there. Like, and I feel grateful to be doing that. Like, it never feels like work. Serving up hot brews, refreshing cold drinks, lots of fresh baked goodies and delicious lunch options. Visit the Mellow Mug in the heart of Larry Utec for dine-in, takeout, or drive through service. Their spacious cafe offers a casual and inviting vibe that's perfect for everything from enjoying a good book, hanging with friends, or meeting a colleague. The Mellow Mug is your neighborhood spot for great coffee and delicious eats and sweets. Girl, 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 you are a rock star, but bringing it back to imposter syndrome, you um, categorize yourself as superhuman, and this does not surprise me in any way um, after listening to you. Um, superhuman, we'll read the definition is, the superhuman measures competence based on how many roles they can both juggle and excel in, falling short in any role as a manager, team member, parent, partner, friend, volunteer, all evoke shame because you feel like you should have been able to handle it all perfectly and easily. Yeah. Yeah. To a T. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So where's superhuman showing up for you? What are all the things you're trying to do? So yeah, like I have, um, I actually have two full-time portfolios. So like basically two jobs, right? And in my office, like there's only maybe one other person who has kind of two main roles like that, right? Like so, and they're full on because our board is also sort of like shifting directions. So like I also had our inquiry-based learning department. Now my job, my goal and my, I see my job is kind of like converging the two, you know, sure. like I'm always converging the things, right? <laughs> like indigenizing it is foundational. So it's always present in doing the things. And then, so it's really nice to be able to like write curriculum for inquiry-based learning through that lens, right? But it's also a lot, like that's pretty full on. And then also make space for those things I'm super passionate about that I really think are very important, like being on the land with students and teachers and co-facilitating, right? So it's, sometimes people ask me like, how was your day? And I'll say like, it was really diverse. Like I did like 10 different kinds of tasks, you know? When, when you're not at work, what are you doing? 
I mean, a variety of of things. Like, I definitely am conscious of the need to uh, regenerate, right? So, like, Saturdays are days for me. Like, usually, I don't go very far from my bed to the couch. <laughs> like, she likes to call them her chambers. Her yeah. chambers. <laughs> For full, bed cha chambers. full chambers days. <laughs> yeah, like oh, where I, like legit, like really am regenerating the energy and you know um, time and all of the just like thoughts and and reflections and of the busy weeks, right? So, so that's quite fascinating. So, do you is that a way for you to combat some imposter syndrome and stuff like just to? Yeah, like it's a complex space, right? Like, so not only you have a lot of projects, but we talk really a lot about kind of the headspace of kind of being in this work and sort of, you know, balancing and really just checking in, like really like being honest about where you are in your work life and, you know, how you're showing up, right? And, you know, obviously I want to be showing up at my max capacity all the time, but that actually isn't realistic because we're humans and we need things, yeah, right? But I feel the pressure to be showing up in my top form all the time and as I I think as I grow even when I was a teacher like Saturdays were kind of like that was the day you sort of like cocooned and kind of regenerated all your patience right so I don't need the same kind of patience as a consultant but I do need the, I do need a sheer a huge amount of energy of creative energy and I think that's something that both of you who work in creative spaces might be able to recognize like that well, need to really ref, like, yeah. rest your brain cells Alex right? and I get peopled out yeah like Big time people that both of us have. It takes me about five minutes. It takes <laughs> yes. me much longer. Yes, less people <laughs> patience than I do. But yeah, I can go for a couple of like if I'm away at a conference, I can go for a couple of days. But boy, it's knocking me back a couple of days after that. Like I am home on the couch. Mm -hmm. I need to pull it together again before I need to get yeah. out in the front of people again. Well, and I think everybody can benefit from kind of that regulation of your nervous system, right? Like that coming down and coming back to yourself and having that quiet time to let thoughts be what they need to be or not be what they need to be and just sort of come back to, I don't know, the core of things before you then go out and, and project and project and, and use up that capacity. But I think everybody could benefit from chamber days. <laughs> well, and, and I love that you call it chamber day. I love that you have a, yeah, like that is, it's, it's like it's protected time. time. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely like it's needed time. Like, I don't think I understood the beginning when I started what it was doing, right? Now yeah. I really, I mean, you know, I think when we're speaking mental health speak and like, you know, just really being like kind to ourselves, that idea of self care and like, you know, kind of like refilling our buckets and charging our batteries and all of those things. But like, for me, I also think like my main instrument is my brain. Like I need to take care of it because it's the thing that you know, <laughs> Well, and it's the thing that that's used most, right? Yeah. Like, like I'm cerebral, I'm creating, I'm making things, I'm, you know, working with people and collaborating. Like, so it's a lot, right? Like, I'm going to start chamber days. They right? are the greatest. You can't even speak to her when she's in her chambers. No, really? it's like, it's, yeah. it's, it's just so really something I give for myself. She brings you know? her food in, she yeah. brings her things, and you are not to interrupt. Do you watch TV? Are you yeah. reading? Yeah. I stream a fair bit. Like, I'd like to read more, but I read, I like, I like read TV, you know, like, Ooh. like, I, I, you know when you're watching a series and it's like could be a book or when you're just like watching a series because you want to unplug from the world yes like i balance those i right? read i read tv also but only yeah. because i've got the yes i also physically read tv yes. but i yes. i mean to say like yeah. i choose tv that's like a book yes and i analyze it in my mind like the characters and whatever just like i would if i was reading a book right like and then i also like what, what's a series you would watch well i just finished the bear Oh, right? I heard it was good. Yeah, like, and the characters are developed just like as if you were reading a, a book, right? You're thinking about those characters, and you're thinking about how they got to be the way they are, which is very different than if I'm, like, binge-watching Below Deck. Like, yeah, but that's good, too. That's <laughs> right, good. but, that's but the good. depth that's of characterization yeah. is... You can only go right? so deep, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, and then I also, I like I said, I enjoy the outdoors, so, like, when the weather is at all amenable, like, we're out, like, making fires and, like, cooking you know, cooking outside and like enjoying nature and going for walks. And like, we play hockey on Monday nights and like, and Vic has a pool. So like, you know, I do aqua fit on Thursdays. <laughs> like, also curl. Yeah, we curl, curl, you know, too. 
yeah, like, you know, you, you gotta... You're in there. You are in the community. You're gotta, doing all the things. Yeah, and then, like, I make time for, like, the celebrations. And, like, if there's a cultural celebration, if there's a feast or a dance, or if, you know, there's a celebration of somebody's life, or if there's a chance to cook for a feast, like, we're doing those things, too. Right? Yes. And your husband is your biggest hype person. My husband is my favorite human. Yeah. Isn't that nice? He's, a, he's such a good supporter. You know, like, if I'm going on the land, like, he's packing my bags with me. Like, you know, he's, if I needed a chaperone when I was a teacher and I needed a male chaperone, like, he's, he's coming to be my male chaperone, like. Did you meet him there? Yep, I met him sort of along my northern journey. And then, and then I had a lot of really amazing influences, right? Like, so I had, like, elders who took me on, you know, along the way and who brought me with them when they went on the land and who talked to me and told me the stories and who, you know, nurtured my desire to be involved and to work and to learn and I had you know indigenous friends I have indigenous friends who you know go out harvesting with me and like you know and pick berries I am happy to cut up caribou with you if that's what's happening or you cut you up know. caribou yeah <laughs> like if you know like if the harvest has happened and there's work to be done like I'm just as happy to be in there doing that work too right like which is those are like passionate things like I'm excited when I get those opportunities because those are cool right I honestly this is a first I will tell you this is a first for me in, in all of in all of our interviews in, in season one and into season two I don't know how to end this interview because I just want to keep learning <laughs> from you that's never happened to me before that's good because I was like, really? Like, what if they don't like me as a guest? And like, what <laughs> no. if I'm not well, I mean, I exciting enough? Like you, so or, yeah, you know, no, you're and they're really not going to be honest with me because they know me? No, like... you're lovely. And that's that's your imposter syndrome talking. Um, thank uh, you for coming. Just because your older you're... sister is a bitch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. I'd end up with an older sister like that. I mean, honestly, can you even believe that we're related? A little bit. A little bit. I'm just surprised. <laughs> The like, most like vain, <laughs> non-nature loving, <laughs> need all the comforts of life always, and uh, then Erica being like amazing. <laughs> oh, Alex, you're amazing too. Mm -hmm. Thanks. You're welcome. I like to think we just <laughs> really fished for that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were good. I am gonna hand this over to Alex. Oh yes. Here you I go. I don't even know part of the time, but also high stakes. I know. Well, these are new questions, so we don't even know what's in here. All new questions. <laughs> and if you're new, it's speed round. How much time do I have? To oh, answer you them? have to very little. Them? Like you just okay, so answer. Speed round. We ask five questions. We would like it if you can keep your answers to one word, if possible, because we want to just go bing, 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 bing. All right. Mm -hmm. You might have trouble going bing, 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 but we'll see. We're going to get some more info out of you. All right. Let's do this. If you could have any job in the world, what would it be? I feel like we just spoke about this for 40 minutes. But. That's right. <laughs> it would be my job. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I would write children's books, actually. Really? Yeah. Oh. What is your zodiac sign? Do you believe in it? Pisces. And I do. I do believe in it. You are a Pisces. Mm -hmm. What is your favorite animal? Turtle. Mm -hmm. Do you have a turtle tattoo? Turtle. Oh, do you? If you could travel back in time, which era would you visit? Hmm. Pre-contact. <gasps> What's your go-to karaoke song? I think I've only done karaoke once, and it was the way we needed my wings. <laughs> and it was <laughs> you. Were Did you guys do it together? Okay, so now. So now we're going we're to go into the show <laughs> with these two. Did you singing. ever know that you're my hero? <laughs> no. You're everything funny. I wish I could be. I can fly higher <laughs> than an eagle. Because you are the wind beneath my wings. Well, oh, God, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> we have ended the show. We're done. <laughs> Thank you for coming, Erica. That's pretty good. Oh, that was awesome. <laughs> Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Imposter Sisters. Please remember, we're not doctors or mental health experts. If you're looking for mental health guidance, 
please see our show notes for local resources. We'd like to thank our location sponsor, The Mellow Mug, located at 64 Del Ridge Lane, for donating this amazing space for us to have these important chats and for supplying us with drinks and goodies. Please give them a follow and make sure to stop in to see this beautiful spot for yourself. Until next time, keep your head high and we will see you next Tuesday.